Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Invisible Museum Tour. Uh, my name is Jeff Olson. I am the Art Education Director with Royal Talents North America, and I'm going to be your co-host today. We, of course, uh, for those of you who have been following us, have a very, very special uh, uh, key host today. Uh, she is uh, an incredible artist, incredible teacher, incredible historian. Her work, her own work, is featured in prominent and private collections throughout the world. Uh, she's a recipient of numerous awards, including the Alex Award in Visual Arts, presented nationally to honored scholars and artists. She's an art historian and educator, as well as a talented artist. She worked for over a decade at the Getty Museum, and her scholarly work is dedicated to uncovering new perspectives regarding the life and work of old masters, including Rembrandt and Durer. She is a co-founder uh, of the nonprofit Project A on a mission dedicated to exploring connections between Western esotericism and the arts. And if that's not enough, folks, she's also the founder of the Z Academy, where she mentors students of all ages based on her own unique experiences and the techniques of old masters for inspiration. Please uh, join me in welcoming Zenya Gershman, everybody. Hello, everybody. Hey, Zenia, Welcome. how are you? <laughs> Great. Welcome back to Invisible Museum Tours. I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, let's so Zenia, uh, while Zenia is doing that, I just want to remind everybody, like and follow us on Facebook uh, and uh, reside in Canada, the U.S., and you'll be eligible uh, to win your very own set of Rembrandt watercolor. And you'll see why that's pertinent to today's uh, uh, presentation when we dive into Dewar here. Are we good? Can you see the screen? Yep, we got you. Looks good. Excellent, excellent. So... Uh, welcome back to our fourth, I can't believe, the fourth episode. I, I have my <laughs> Renaissance hat in celebration. Extremely, extremely proud of that, Jeff. <laughs> uh, so I just wanted to uh, get us in the mood for what's to come today for the next hour, an hour and a half journey that we take. Um, and this is really meant, as you know, as some of you who are new, um, it's interactive. So we want your comments. We want your questions. Uh, we monitor and we weave it in and literally I've pre over prepared. I have too many slides so that I can actually change direction as we speak. So please, please, please participate. That's what we'd love uh, to make it for you, not just a, a program that's static. So I, I want to take us right into the feeling of what we're about to talk about. And there are the words that I want you to hear. And these are virus, epidemic, political divide, death. And no, I'm not talking about 2020. I'm talking about the turn of the century between the end of 1400s and beginning of 1500s. And this is what our hero today, the German Renaissance artist Albrecht Dürer is facing. So I wanted right away to make him real to you. This is not a master artist in the museum. This is one of us, a human being that's undergoing a huge transition in time. And uh, as a good girl, I've been taught that there are two subjects uh, that are taboo, that when we are in a nice uh, dinner party that we should not bring up. And that is, as you know, politics and religion. And these are the two subjects that we're going to bring up the most today because it is simply impossible to talk about Albrecht Dürer outside of politics and religion of his time. This is really connected to his art, really connected in his output, and what is and how it is speaking to us today. So I'm really excited about this. I hope you are. And with that, I want to show you the first paradox. So we meet uh, uh, the what, what I would like to call, Jeff, I don't know if you will agree with me, but I, I'd like to call this the Mona Lisa of watercolor. <laughs> so this particular hair uh, has become immortalized by Albrecht Dürer. And it is already, he's so, so odd in every way. He's going to revisit every subject matter, every to do and not to do in art. He's not going to follow the canon. So here we see, instead of uh, even a picture of a saint or a picture of a wealthy man, we have a portrait of an animal, right? And it is in a scientific, done in a scientific way. When I say watercolor, uh, Jeff is going to tell us a little bit more about this technique throughout the presentation, the middle of the presentation. But this is not an easy technique. It's uh, um, uh, hard to get edges, it's hard to get precision, but this is done in such a scientific way as if we're looking underneath a magnifying glass at the detail of this hair. Now this model is not 
like particularly a best model in the world. So there's already a lot of questions. Did he have a stuffed animal? But it doesn't look like it is painted from death. It really has a presence to it. And for that, and if that's so, how was he able, without the photography, without the tools we have today, how is he able to be so precise? So I'd just like to take you a little bit closer. And what surprises me, it's not just how the hair is growing and how this, uh, the presence of this animal. But look at the eye. I specifically bring you the detail of the eye because we have here a reflection, not just a highlight, but can you see what it is? It's a reflection of a window. This hair is in 1500s in the presence of Durer, and we have the same window that would have reflected the light into his space, into his studio, in the eye. You see the two strokes, the vertical strokes. So incredible uh, scientific analysis. Uh, scientists and botanists who look at Durer's work of his plant work today um, study uh, scientifically the species that he was looking at. But, but the paradox that I'd like to present to you, that at the same, basically within the, uh, a distance of a couple of years, we have a different aspect of Durer. And I pause here for a moment so you get used to this image, uh, this incredible engraving of what? The subject is the witch. So the same man who believes in science, and I bring you a bit closer here, the same man that believes in science, we know how uh, uh, fascinated Durer was with science. He published many books uh, on math dedicated to mathematics and geometry, um, and he was really interested in studying nature. Equally, has this, we might say, belief in superstition. What we see here is a witch, and not only this witch is writing a demonic character, uh, she, her preferred uh, mode of transportation. She is actually, according to the beliefs, uh, traveling backwards because evil was supposed to be a mirror image, a reverse image of everything good. So if we travel forward, she's going to travel backwards. So it's a kind of an interesting uh, setup here. And uh, th there was a lot of superstitions like there are still today. I mean, many cultures and traditions have them. And we are going to look at this. How do we reconcile the same man who wears the same hat like Jeffrey, uh, who's interested in both science and superstition and angels, demons, witches. How is this possible? And I'm going to hopefully show you that there is a reconciliation, that this there is a purpose to this, and it is not at all so opposite as we come to think of it. Then you have a question for you at the bottom yes. of that print. It looked like his monogram was in reverse as well. Was that intentional to the subject matter? You know, Jeffrey, I think you had just discovered something brilliant. I had not noticed uh, noticed this before, and uh, I would say yes, I would absolutely agree that uh, because this is the first time in all of his prints that I see that, and that is genius. We should just uh, copyright it right now and uh, write an article together about this. <laughs> that was one of those brilliant moments. And if anybody in the audience also sees something that I haven't mentioned that Jeffrey hasn't mentioned, Bring it on. Let's let's make our discoveries as we keep going. This is great. Are we going to talk a lot about his monogram? So we will return to this idea in a moment. But I want you to meet Durer the teenager. This is Durer, uh, Albert Durer, Albert, who uh, draws himself at 13 years old. Now, what is interesting about this? Many, many, many things are interesting about this. First of all, the genre of portraiture does not, or self-portrait, the genre of self-portrait does not exist in Germany at the time as it does today um, throughout the world. So it is very odd for a child this young to look in the mirror and decide to draw themselves. Not to mention that it's very hard because as you see, he's looking away. So he has to actually imagine what his eyes would look, look like when he's not looking in the mirror, right? So there is a conceptual element to this drawing that's very difficult. We know that this is done from a mirror uh, by a number of clues. The first clue I'm going to give you is his other arm. The one that he's not pointing to would have been his right arm because that's a reflection in the mirror, so it's reversed. So what it looks like a left arm to us is actually going to be a, his right arm. It's the arm he's drawing with, so he's hiding it, right? So uh, that's our first clue. But there is even a strong clue that we will consider in a moment. Um, the other thing that's so fascinating about this drawing is that it is 
the youngest self-portrait in art history that we know of. So I pause there for a moment. This is the youngest artist we know as a self-portrait in the history of Western European art. So in a way, this is one of the first, if not the first Dürer drawing we know, and we meet him as himself. Fascinating. That tells you how, how out of the box, how amazing this person is. Now, I just want to come in a little bit closer and tell you about the technique. The technique is mind-blowing as well. This is silver point. This is the most difficult technique there is in the history of art. I would, I would absolutely say that because I've tried all of them and this is incredible. What you're using to create it, first of all, the paper has to be prepared correctly. You have to have a layer of gesso so it has a kind of a smooth quality to it. And then you use an actual stick of silver. When you touch it to the surface of gesso, as it oxidizes, it leaves a mark. I want you to think of something so trivial as taking a key and marking a, a side wall with a key so the metal is oxidizing and leaving that mark. That mark is very even. It has no beauty to it. You can't make it lighter. You can't make it darker, right? So it's very even and constant. So it's very difficult to create dramatic, exciting effect of lights and darks. The other thing, it's not erasable. You cannot have a mistake. So here we have a young boy of 13 doing a self-portrait from a mirror with silver point where he's not allowed to have any mistakes. Incredible. Right, Jeff? Absolutely. Silver point is so challenging. And I was going to comment on that too, the fact that you, know, you couldn't go back and fix something. This had to be successful from the get-go. It's just amazing. Now, Definitely I want prodigy. You I want you to notice the hair. On the, our left side, it's gorgeous. On the right side, it looks stringy and spaghetti-like. That's where the damage occurred, and somebody else later tried to change it and fill in the blanks. That's not Dura hair. So already at 13, he's better than some conservator who's trying to fix the damage. And if we actually go back, uh, you can see the same thing with a, a little bit part of the sleeve is gone, um, and it's not as good as the sleeve on our left side. Really, really incredible. Okay, how else do we know for sure, for certain, that this is a self-portrait? Well, in the upper right of the print, a few years later, Durer writes to us, this I drew myself from a mirror in the year 1484 when I was still a child. Albrecht Dürer, right? So he actually goes back to this drawing. He saved this drawing, and he goes back and reflects, hey, that's my kid drawing. This is me where I started. So I find it really endearing, really fascinating, but also want to early on attract your eye, uh, eyes and your attention to how Dürer works with image and text. Uh, this is very important to It him. is very that's interesting, that. yeah. There's text in, in so many of his paintings, and... Uh self-explanatory like this too, almost like he's creating a biography, right? Or an autobiography. Extremely interesting. So how do we look at his art? Is it really a book or is it a painting or draw? He kind of draws upon the, the format of a book where you have text and image and he brings it to his painting, drawings and prints. So this is fascinating. I want you to kind of remember this as we go through the presentation. So. Uh, who is responsible for allowing Dürer to become an artist? It's his dad. And I just want you to look at this somber, intimidating face. Uh, there is a number of Dürer's father's self-portraits uh, by Albert Dürer Jr., because his father's name was also Albert. But this is my absolutely favorite. This is in the National Gallery. If we were to travel to a museum, and I hope you all go at some point, National Gallery is one of my favorite museums in the world in Washington. This is really a gem. Uh, the, the presence, the watercolor effect in the background versus the thickness of his jacket, the translucency of his face, the delicacy and yet the severity of his presence, really remarkable. So Dürer was one of Drum roll, 18 children. <laughs> Albrecht, Albrecht uh, the elder, married at 40 years old, a 15-year-old girl who gave birth to those 18 children in 26 years. I mean, just imagine Dura's mother. He was incredibly busy. And uh, Dura was the third third out of those 18, and there was big hopes on him because um, Albrecht the Elder, he was a goldsmith. 
and a goldsmith was very profitable position, very profitable profession, and it required incredible art of drawing. Albrecht Dürer's father trained in the Netherlands. Um, he trained how to draw with incredible precision because for his commissions, when we say goldsmith, could be statuettes, could be reliquary for the church, could be complicated my miniature commissions in gold that are on the, on the emotional and imaginary scale of Michelangelo, but reduced to miniature artworks in gold. So the Dura was showing, must have showed a great talent in this profession because you can see already at 13 how he's drawing. Uh, his father sends him to Latin school so that he has the best education, uh, reads Latin, knows the classical literature, and then begins to prepare him to become a master. And at this point, we know from Dura's diaries that he tells his dad that he wants to be an artist. And it must have been a blow to Albrecht the father because he's losing this tradition that he could pass on to his son, but the best thing he does is he allows him to not only become an artist, but to go study with the most important teacher of the time. So I just want to already thank Albrecht uh, Sr. for the contribution he did in uh, the artist career, one of the most important artist career that we know, Albrecht Dürer. So he goes to study, Dura goes to study for three years at a tender age, as a teenager. Um, he goes, I think he is, let's see, around 15, uh, 15 years old when he goes to the studio of Michael Volgamot. And here you see a portrait by Dura of his teacher. Now, the training was very difficult. You had to start at the bottom, learn how to grind paints, learn how to engrave uh, the wood blocks because Volgamot was very interested in uh, printmaking and printing books, had a, uh, collaborated uh, with uh, the best printmakers of the time to create some of the most important books that were printed in Nuremberg. By the way, I did not, I forgot to mention that Dura is born in Nuremberg. And Nuremberg was considered uh, the eyes and ears of Germany of the time, specifically because the printmaking was so um, extensive that all the books, all the knowledge was coming out of that little city, that beautiful city that you could still visit today. Now, uh, what's amazing about training of Dürer, he had very difficult years and mixed feelings because the older students must have made fun of him and given him the least interesting task. Nevertheless, he survived the training and after three years he went around Germany and neighboring countries to travel. This was a tradition for the young man to acquire then uh, material, techniques and materials from outside masters. But we always know that these two men, this is why I pose with these two incredible portraits. And even though, look at their noses, their mouths, their eyes, they look so different. But the presence of this severity, intensity, I mean, think about this. Uh, Volgamont was like a second father to Dura. He lived in his studio for three years. Um, so there's a sense, there's a similarity between these two uh, important men in Dura's life. And we know how important this portrait was and this teacher was to Durer because he held on to this portrait in his own studio. He hung it in his studio and he added the writing again. So you see how at the top uh, on the green background we have writing again. So Durer says this portrait was done by Albrecht Durer of his teacher Michael Volgamot in 1516 to which he later adds once his teacher dies, and he was 82 years old, and he lived until 1519 when he departed this life on St. Andrew's Day morning before sunrise. So there's a kind of uh, dedication. This, this portrait becomes from just a living portrait to uh, um, a surrogate, a memory, almost a, a, it becomes an epitaph like on the grave that he places on this painting. We, our last tour, if you joined us, was on Fayum portraits, the mummy portraits from Egypt. And we really see this, this idea that carrying on, remembrance, capturing of the spirit in this image. All right. Now you're ready to meet Durer, the, the already mature man, the gorgeous man that he was. I present you Albrecht Durer. <laughs> now this is a portrait that he's done 
um, at the age of 28, and it is perhaps one of the most famous self-portrait, if not the most self famous self-portraits uh, in the history of Western European art tradition. So Dura ha is known for have done more portraits than any living artist at the time or even later. The next artist who's going to rival the self-portrait idea will be Rembrandt. Also, that was, I believe, our first episode of Invisible Museum Tours. So please go back and watch that if you can. But uh, Durer here, I chose this particular self-portrait because it is so incredible in so many ways. And I hope that together today we'll even discover more things uh, that have not been mentioned. The first thing I want you to notice is a kind of amazing intimacy that we have here. The way he crops the painting, the arm really rests on the edge of the work of art, making us feel like we are coming so close to him. He is looking us frontally, really addressing every viewer through time. This is made 520 years ago. It feels like he's still addressing you directly. He has let his hair down in his incredible curls. We know that he loved and fashioned his appearance through uh, his own diaries and those of his friends. He was even at times ridiculed for how much time he spent curling his hair and even dyeing sometimes uh, the color. Uh, so there is this beauty that he wants to present not only in the painting but his own image. Uh, the details, the tactility, he touches slightly his jacket and with that touch we start to feel the fur and we forget that this is an oil on panel and we really start to feel the warmth and the softness of the material. He's set against a dark background, so this is really quite revolutionary to take away the landscape, to take away the context, and to almost like a backdrop in the photographer's studio in 2020, focus on the psychology of this image. Really unheard of, especially for a self-portrait. I want to go a little bit closer. And when we go a little bit closer, we notice just at his eye level, by the way, you see in his eyes the reflection? It should look very familiar. We saw it in his hair, the, the little bunny, right? Uh, the same window reflecting in Dura's eye, in the same studio that he's painting. But at the eye level, right, we have two of his signatures. On our left side, we have the famous anagram. Again, we're going to come back to it in a little bit later and look at it in detail. And he says, A.D., Albrecht Dura painted it in what year? 1500. 1500 is incredibly important. It repeats again in the Latin phrase on the right, again, through the eye level, through the eyes. We get to the right size, and he writes there in Latin, I, Albrecht Dürer of Nuremberg, portrayed myself in everlasting colors. That's a good motto for Rembrandt paints, everlasting colors, at age 28 years old in year 1500. So, you can't miss it. 1500 is incredibly important. Why is it so? We were chatting a little bit with Jeff just before we started the uh, live session. 1500 was middle of the millennium, and it felt like year 2000, where, where uh, here in our part of the world, uh, we were thinking about Y2K, and that is going to, the computer's changeover is going to cause havoc and the end of the world. The same sensation was talked about in the end of 1400s, that this uh, must be the end of the world. There's so many plagues, there's so many, much political unrest, there's so many problems. This must be the time that was prophesied in the Bible, and Christ will come and save everything. This will be the end of the world. There'll be the great judgment. And many prepared for this. You know, if you're going to face the end of the world, you better prepare your best image. And it is thought that Dura prepared the self-portrait in expectation. If he's going to perhaps meet Christ, imagine, if it's the end of the world, how are you going to present, present yourself? You're going to present yourself in your best way. But there is more. I want you to also think about his uh, signature. Uh, he specifically underlines the initials that they're A.D., because they have double meaning to him. A.D. literally is the first letter of his first name and his last name, Albrecht Dürer, but it also the first letters 
of Anno Domini. In Latin, the year of our Lord, A.D., right? The way that we mark the year beginning the birth of Christ. So it is a way to say this self-portrait is by Albrecht Dürer in Anno Domini, in the year of expectation of the era of Christ. So here we already have a double meaning. There's another meaning, too, uh, for the anagram. Dur in German is a word for door, and the A represents a gate. So his his A D is is representative of this passage way, passing through uh, the gateway of Albrecht Dur. I, I've always found that fascinating since I first learned that. Amazing, and you're going to see more about that. I have a special slide um, that I'm going to hold off. So there's please a quick rem question too. Uh -huh. uh, you know, some Heather is asking mm -hmm. if if Caravaggio studied this portrait. Do you think? I'm, I'm Imagine we'd have to speculate, but I would have to say he certainly was aware of it, don't you think? So Albrecht Dürer was extremely famous from the beginning of his career. If you want the starving artist myth, it's not going to hold up with Albrecht Dürer. At the end of his life, he has two homes and lots of money in the bank. And uh, it is even said that when he traveled to the nether, I think it was Antwerp, uh, when he walked in the hallway with all the artists and nobility and even the prince uh, waiting for him, he got a standing ovation like the Oscars. He walked in like the king of artists. So this particular portrait was a revelation from the beginning. Uh, it is thought that it was actually done as part of the campaign of the humanists that were centered. There were great humanists uh, living in uh, Nuremberg, uh, scholars, great scholars who were interested in the progress and the science and the uh, equality and democracy. And they worked with Dürer and actually asked the Dürer and guided the Dürer to create the self-portrait as a humanist manifesto. So we have here the man coming in the center, believing in the importance of man and believing in our task and how we can better the world by ourselves instead of just going to the church, right, and praying and paying the dues. The humanist said, no, look at yourself, look inside. And so this portrait would have been known uh, to, to artists across the world and across the time, imitated and emulated, envied, all the time. In fact, Dürer was uh, paranoid that artists want to poison him because there was such rivalry. So when he traveled, he checked on what the food he was eating because he was afraid that in Venice, when he traveled to Italy, he might get poisoned out of envy. If so there's a good question, question by that. There's another question by William about what type of papers were used. I do know that Nuremberg was the center for paper making at the time of Dürer's life, and they uh, used the Italian method. Uh, so I'm sure they were rag papers or cotton papers that were made. Uh, beyond that, I'm not 100% sure what uh, exactly the type of paper Dürer was using in some of those images. Uh, but maybe I, our friend what I, Hammer Mule. Yeah, what I'd like to add to that is that almost always Dürer tinted his papers. So he didn't like to draw on the white or white surface, uh, neutral yeah. background. He wanted to add a little bit of blue to his uh, watercolors or his drawings. Uh, and so as you look at his drawings, I didn't include too many today just because we have a limit of time. But as you go and research his drawing, the paper is almost always tinted. And I know that the Rembrandt simulates this kind of tinted papers for drawing in watercolor, and you can actually purchase an album and experiment uh, with this technique, which is so great. There's a question but, also, which I think you, uh, now you're getting right into it. Uh, Nika is saying, is he implying that he is Christ? And I'm going to turn it over to you. <laughs> All right. Nika is my, um, um, uh, actually, my underground detective. This is my, my 12-year-old daughter, unless oh. there's another <laughs> Nika imposter out there. <laughs> And thank you for asking, um, and I hope your school doesn't get mad that you are doing this instead of uh, being in class right now. Uh, <laughs> so yes, uh, I wanted to bring to your attention this incredible memling portrait that comes of, out of the tradition. This is actually here local for me, uh, near Los Angeles. We have a, sm a beautiful city called Pasadena, and one of the best museums, the Jewels, tiny little museum, Norton Simon Museum of Art. Um, and this memling is here locally, which is incredible for California. And this comes out of a northern European tradition of painting Christ um, as Salvatore Mundi. 
what me what it means Salvatore Mundi is the savior of the world so this is a very interesting tradition we have Christ very close up now this is going to sound familiar frontal right on the dark background and blessing with his hand and look at the kind of a position of the hand so I bring you here for a reminder and you look compositionally um, uh, Christ next to Durer right really incredible similarity so not only um, Durer would say I'm painting myself as Christ but I'm painting myself as the savior of the world now this is a pretty big uh, shoes to wear and I want to throw out the first question of the day at our wonderful audience today why if you could paint yourself why would you paint yourself in the disguise in the place in the identification as God that's something that I'm going to throw out there I know it's going to take a moment to answer but while you thinking about that we're going to keep going a little bit but the similarity here is striking one of the differences though that I'd like to point out is uh, the Salvador Mundi portrait is usually incredibly symmetrical so if you look at the left and right side of the face of Christ there is a kind of a be symmetrical beauty where already Dura is trying to play with it he's adding more chiaroscuro more light and dark more imperfections within his face more play with how he's different on both sides so he's complicating this image by creating the dynamic differences with it within the frontal symmetry even his hand uh, the other hand is not visible right so there is there's already that complication now I bring you to another famous uh, portrayal of Christ and this is known as Veronica veil I wonder how many of you heard of this term Veronica veil sometimes it's also referred to as sudarium sudarium literally from Latin uh, means a sweat cloth now this is a tradition a story that is not found in the Bible it's a later story um, that surfaces a myth a Christian myth that on his way on his path when Christ was already arrested he fell down and he was sweating and he was dirty and on his path of uh, Dolorosa in Jerusalem there was a beautiful woman who reached out and gave him part of her garment she gave him whatever cloth that she had shared to wipe his sweat and wipe his dirt she had such compassion while the Roman soldiers were mocking him and torturing him and as a kind of a gift return gift when she got the dirty sweaty cloth back and she opened it there was the most beautiful imprint of Christ's face so if you will this is the first photograph that ever was created now this image was considered miraculous and not made by human hand literally an imprint think about printmaking that's so important for Dura right so this imprint from divine face not made by hand now for every artist throughout art history it became the quintessential image to compete with how do I make a painting that I made by my hand but I let kind of divine energy come through that it becomes miraculous right how do I make the impossible how do I erase Genia, how do I raise Albrecht Dürer and let God step forward and reveal his miracle so in some ways we can think about that this is not only um, an, a self-portrait as Christ but perhaps this nod this idea how can artists think of creating within divine power with letting the spiritual come through their art more of a devotional practice than even painting now I wonder if we have any comments from our audience before we move on we do uh, in response to your request of why he might pay uh, paint himself as Christ we have one that says uh, to get people to believe that you hold that status there's uh, Heather says because of the deep suffering which I think is interesting uh, when we talk about his image melancholy um, to believe that all great artists competed to be the best the one that you shall follow I think that's interesting too yeah so actually if you think about it the artists were looked down 
through medieval times. They were thought as a bottom of the craftsman. Uh, probably the shoemaker, the bootmaker, was more was making more money and more status than a painter. So Rem, uh, Rembrandt, I almost said Rembrandt because Rembrandt adores Dura. Dura, like Rembrandt later, uh, wants to elevate this idea. It's very important to Dura. And so to say that artist is not a craftsman, artist is a creator. And as God creator, artist creates images. We are artists, the eyes for the world. We give the possibility to see the divine through the work of art. Now, this is a very novel idea, very revolutionary idea. Um, but also, very interesting, the idea of suffering. Look at the next image we're going to take a look at. This is another self-portrait, but made 22 years later, when Dura already was a very sick man. And he paints, uh, he actually, um, I should say, draws himself. This is a pencil on a blue-green prime paper. That's what we were talking about uh, in the uh, Bremen Museum. He draws, he chooses to draw himself, not as this glorious, gorgeous image, intimidating and blessing image of God, but God or Christ at his biggest suffering. This is uh, during the Passion of Christ when he, again, he's tortured and um, uh, he's mocked. And this is the down moment in right before he's crucified. And we see that Durer is crossing his hands and he has the object of torture that would have been used to torture Christ. And he identifies with this moment in Christ's life. Now, Passion of Christ, this, this story, this part of the story of Christ, literally comes from that word patience. So it's a kind of patience that you show during the, the challenge, the greatest challenge that you might be facing throughout your life. Something we could really relate to now with the pandemic going on, a kind of patience that we ask to endure, right? Um, and how are we going to last and show ourselves? This is what endures mind. So this is a very different approach. He will return thinking again and again. What does it mean? I think that's the question he asks. What does it mean to be an artist? Uh, what, what does it mean to create? And how does it relate to spirituality and religion? Because he was deeply religious man. Isn't it interesting that the word patient means both to be patient or to be calm and, and wait patiently, we use that. But it's also the word for somebody who's being treated by a doctor, somebody who's ill, uh, it, you know, the same root word, to be patient, to be a patient. As it's so appropriate here because he is his own patient here because he's mm -hmm. the model. So he is a yeah. kind of a patient that <laughs> Dura the doctor examines himself, right? So <laughs> if, if we could play with this, we continue playing. We can play with, with all the words, yeah. Language yeah. is important. Well, language is important to Dura, right? Extremely, and we're going to really come back to that idea, to uh, playing with words. So this is something that I wanted to bring to you, that Dura was so famous and so venerated that he almost became venerated like a saint, like Christ himself, and this is a little relic that is cherished by the Vienna Academy of Art, a lock of Durer's hair. This is how we know what color uh, his hair was, and I think parts of it is slightly dyed, so that's how we know also that he liked to beautify himself. Um, and uh, this was found in the collection of Durer's friend and his best student, Hans Baldung, who was a very, if you want to look up this artist, very strange. Uh, it's kind of like he takes the witches and devils of Durer and puts up an times 10 a notch, right? Really kind of disturbed, unbelievable visions. And we don't know if Dura gave it to him as a gift during his life or if it was trimmed out of his coffin and preserved as a kind of a relic. I wanted to show you that, however, if we fantasize in this self-portrait, we see the bang slightly trimmed. But it's almost like it looks like the missing hair that we see here uh, uh, surviving. And this is how it's preserved, really, like a reliquary um, in a museum. Uh, something that people travel, like a pilgrimage, to see, uh, just to connect, to feel the presence of this great artist. OK, but I did want to say, meet Durer, the humorist, the, the one that has great sense of humor. So this is by Durer. This is a portrait by Durer. Now, if I show that to you in the beginning, you probably wouldn't believe me. Uh, this is from a letter that he writes to his best friend, Willibald Perkheimer. 
and uh, it's filled with curious observations, drawings, um, coded drawings that you're supposed to work out as a rebus. As some people had said that this could possibly be a self-portrait that doesn't work for me because he's missing his famous beard, but it does actually look, this is his best friend, Willibald Perkheimer, and if you look side by side at these two portraits, I think he might be actually portraying his best friend humorously here. Recognize the nose, the roundness of the sockets, um, and even the corners of the mouth slightly poked up, even when he's not smiling, and a kind of a round triple chin that he has, and funny little hair, right? Curled <laughs> hair. Now, I did, do need to think right away, if I had a hat, I would take it off, uh, Perkheimer. Perkheimer and Dura were a very unlikely friendship because they came with very different modes of society, levels, strata of society. Perkheimer came from the highest aristocratic family that was on the level of uh, friendship with emperors. Dura was more from a working class, lower to middle class family. Perkheimer was educated like a prince. He translated from Greek and Latin. He had the most amazing library of his time. People, the smartest people traveled to have a glimpse of his library. He helped Dürer in so many ways. They were almost inseparable. He gave him ideas for complicated, unknown subject matter. He helped him with uh, allowing him to his library and letting him read some of the uh, uh, volumes that were not printed elsewhere, you could not find elsewhere. And he even supported him financially. He, uh, whenever Dura needed, and didn't have enough money to travel or, uh, um, and as a repaying, as a thank you, Dura gifted him with lots of drawings and paintings and uh, etchings. So I just he wanted to him right to the away. emperor too, didn't he? Introduced him to the emperor. And uh, here, he is very interesting. This is uh, an engraving by Dürer of his best friend. Um, but what's so unusual, he actually adds a, a kind of an epitaph that you would find on a grave, as if Perkheimer had died. Now, Perkheimer is going to outlive Dürer, but it's almost like Dürer wants to create a monument, even during the life of Perkheimer. And here it um, says at the bottom in, in uh, Latin, long live the genius, or you could translate it, or the spirit, all else is mortal. So he's, Dura is identifying that the, the mind of Berkheimer is really what to be celebrated. All else is unimportant, all else it will pass, but that great mind and spirit of this man will remain immortal. I wanted to uh, change um, and take a look um, at one of the most famous um, one of the most famous watercolors by uh, Dürer, and co come to it with this idea of religiosity that we looked at uh, just a moment ag uh, ago with Christ and self-portrait as Christ, possibly as Christ but taking away that religion and also the intellectual capacity that Perkheimer, his friend, gave him through his library. When we take those ideas and look at what we are presented with, and again, this is one of the most famous works of art in the history of art, it's actually kind of mind-blowing. Because if we were to describe what it is, if we literally had to catalog, Jeffrey, what would you say we're looking at? Of, of this, I would say it's a botanical study of some type of plant or plants. If you just saw it's, it without knowledge of its authorship, right? Uh, yeah, it's just kind of botanical study, but already, remember, we're dealing with Dürer. And Dürer is not going to give you a regular botanical study. Botanical studies, and we're going to see it in just a moment, uh, were really disconnected from their environment, where you would take a plant like a specimen and almost look at it microscopically, but never in situ, never in the land and the place and the environment where it grows. So already we have a complication, and this is termed not by Dura, by uh, catalogers, historians, as a great piece of turf. And turf is literally being the land, right? A little yeah. piece of land that Dura is looking at. Now already sure. I want to ask you, how would you paint this? How would you see this? You would have to literally get down on your knees or lie down to get this perspective. You can't do this from above. Look at how he's looking straight on and we get all these details, right? Let's come in a little bit closer. 
and we have all these interactions by the plants. We have the complexity of the plants. We know which plant grows with another. We also have an amazing moment. Most of them have not opened yet. There is a sense of pregnancy and potential, a revelation, a secret of nature that is going to gift us with blossoming of these flowers. If we keep going, this is a type of uh, contemporary, uh, this is a little bit later, 1594, but this is typical of a contemporary botanical approach where the artist takes all the species and lays them out scientifically, right? So we have a butterfly, we have the, the caterpillar, we have the flower that it might be pollinating, we have the metamorphosis described here, right? So very, very interesting how different, this is artistic, this is not in its environment, right? And um, I would say, if we compare it again, it's truly striking. And if we go back to a question, why would Dura paint this little piece of land, and not as we see as botanically accepted, why would he do this? I want to open this up back again to our viewers. Why would he do this? This is the first time that we see it in the history of the uh, Western civilization of painting a little piece of dirt with a few plants growing on them. While you're trying to answer, why are you uh, thinking about this, I want to show you the artist who is closer to Dürer, and it's going to take about 400 years to catch up to Dürer. And we have, of course, Van Gogh's irises at the Getty Museum. Um, our second Invisible Museum tour was dedicated to this work of art. So if you haven't watched it, please go back and watch it if you're interested. But here, though the technique is different from watercolor to oil, you see that same dirt, that same lowering yourself down and closing up and looking at nature, looking at the wind, looking at the light, a very different way. It takes about, again, 400 years to understand Durer the way he had it, intended it. Now, I wonder if we have any comments. Uh, nothing as of yet. I mean, one thing that it strikes me as is as a self-contained landscape especially comparing this to his other watercolor landscapes that he painted, uh, and which were really the first in European art, right? Uh, in Asian art, certainly we had landscapes and watercolors that date back 6,000 years, but in European painting, it really didn't exist. And, and the use of the watercolor medium, I think, is a wonderful uh, here as well. But, but to me, it's like a, a miniature trompe l'oeil landscape I wonder if he dug it up with a shovel and set the whole piece of turf on his table so that he could sit in his studio and paint it. This is really interesting. There's a lot of controversy and disagreement. Did he compose this or did he happen to see it like this, right? There is, and probably there is a little bit of both. Um, I'd like to add that since landscape itself was so controversial, you would never paint nature for its own sake in the Western European art tradition, like Jura was the first to really start that in German art, that this would be even more controversial, a piece of dirt with a few plants, right? So this is taking away from landscape being the backdrop from for uh, religious paintings to landscape for its own sake to just this little microcosm. Now this, we might say, was a religious aspect of Durer's tradition. Uh, uh, during this time, we have a very famous movement started by Martin Luther of called Reformation of the Church. And Martin Luther was really against the Catholic uh, establishment and having the Pope and the Church dictate the role that God should play in the uh, everyday life. For instance, the Bible was not present in the everyday home. Luther translated the Bible from Latin to German and wanted to make sure that each individual could read it and determine for themselves what it meant. So putting the faith in the hands of the believer. And this kind of idea was also emphasized that you don't necessarily even have to go to the church. You can go to nature and nature being a human being hence humanism, go inside yourself like a little microcosm and discover God or spirituality within. So instead of looking up at heavens and painting God in the sky and the clouds, we can go down to the little dirt and bugs and find God there equally. So 
microscopic world and view of God. Very interesting uh, switch in a kind of religious and scientific men men mentality. There's some comments coming in now, Zinia. Uh, Margaret says a connection to the earth that feeds the plants. Uh, Heather, uh, an, interest, an interest in genuine things and telling the story uh, using suggested symbolism, like you had mentioned. So there's a couple things folks were, were saying. Yes, so deeply symbolic. We're only scratching the surface today. I wish we did a five-part series on Dura, right? So we could take each plant and talk about the symbolic nature and what it might represent, the healing property, the hallucinatory quality that were used in ecstatic ceremonial religious practices, the reefs that were woven, again, for ceremonial practices. So we could take the symbolic of what seems to be so simple, so straight down, and hence, remember where we started with the paradox of superstition and science, the two are entwined, right? So let's keep okay. going. There's a double this meaning a to that uh, as well. Not only is it a finished painting of a landscape as the landscape of subject itself, but the use of watercolor was really just before this in European a preparatory use. So he's presenting the medium also as a finished piece of work. And I think that's something that's really important with Durer's uh, relationship to the history of watercolor, that he saw this as a medium worthy of what he felt was the most important subject matter. Jeff, you just gave me a brilliant idea. I thought you were going to say it, but I'm going to steal it because I vibed it from you. But uh, <laughs> that the fact that we have water painted in watercolor, and water is the main ingredient, right? Uh, the, the medium that we're using to dilute the paint and make it runny, and it's, it has a very different quality from oil paint or from um, egg tempera paint. The fact that we have water rendered at the bottom of this landscape in watercolor, right? Self-referential -refer for the technique is also extremely interesting. It's, uh, it's, and that's one of his innovations with watercolor too, the wet into wet technique. And, uh, I, you know, something that wasn't used before in European art uh, in watercolor. And then also his working, which is common knowledge then, but this idea of working uh, what, he, what he called reversed white space, which is essentially working from light to dark as opposed to working dark to light, which was an oil, uh, oil painting. Incredible. And, and this is really too. interesting. So we do see that light background and that the darkness of the a foreground building up, very reverse. Probably yeah. comes from his uh, experience with uh, wood blocks, which is the same idea, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, I so keep too. trying to flash this quote, but we're going to go back. It was supposed to be like really a big revelation, but you've seen it three times now. <laughs> <laughs> For in truth, art lies hidden in nature. He who can wrest it from her possesses art. So this idea that you will find God in nature, not in church, that there is a secret in nature. I want you to remember that. That really helps us understand and position some of his work. And I love this word that he uses in German, uh, which is translated as rest, which means wrestle that you don't just observe it, you kind of wrestle with nature to bring out her secret, right? So I want you to put that in the back of your mind. And here we look even closer. If we thought we were close up, now we're going even closer. Now we're looking at a bug, right? We're looking at the stag beetle. So think about the size of this uh, drawing. This is nine by four inches housed at the J. Paul Getty Museum where I worked for over a decade and had seen it without glass on many occasions and taught with it a thousand times in person. So this is actually an old friend. He makes this uh, little watercolor, again, using a combination of watercolor and gouache um, uh, on paper, on tiny little piece of paper. And I want you to ask yourself, I'm going to ask you five times, why in the world would you go even closer and paint something that's kind of scary looking, a bug, a menacing looking bug, right, in such gorgeous detail? No longer are we even looking at a self-portrait. No longer we're looking at Christ. No longer we're looking at nature. Now we're looking at bugs. We're getting even closer to the microcosm um, of um, our environment. And before we answer that question, which we will in many ways, I want you to now finally look at Dewar's anagram, AD, once again with me. And something that I haven't seen talked about, um, but something that I have observed that I love to point out, if you look at how he designed the A, 
Do you see this little things at the <laughs> ends? He actually changed it to look like the pincers of the, the bug, right, of the beetle. This is not usually present on his usual signature. And already um, Jeff had mentioned that Durer's name, Durer's roots are from Hungary. And he came, this is a coat of art he designed in 1523, but his father is the one who traveled from a small village of Akosti to uh, Germany. And Akosti from Hungarian can translate as the door. So the door in German, you could say Tur or Dur. And Durer's father became Albrecht Durer with a T. It was Durer who changed it to Albrecht Durer. And the reason again, you see the anagram here at the top, right, is because now we have the play on AD, Anno Domini, right? So the D, the door, the opening, the way that, uh, that uh, Jeff has talked about here in his family crest, coat of arms, you could actually see he's creating the doorway. He's putting this in his family tree, the doorway into Durer's world. Really important. But now back to a beetle. Wow, why would we be looking at this famous Palma Gartner altarpiece in order to understand the beetle? Now this is again, you probably won't find in art history books. This is an observation that I've been working with my intern at Project A, Maria Danova, for many years. Um, and this is extremely interesting. So we have the nativity scene painted around 1500. This is a very famous altarpiece by Durer. It was actually uh, attacked and millions of dollars uh, cost to restore it. But on the right and on the left, we have two saints, Saint George and Saint Ustash. Saint Ustash is on the right side as we look at it. These are two brothers who actually commissioned this masterpiece. We're going to concentrate at Saint Ustash. And when we look at him, we notice that he's holding, he's wearing his hunting uniform and he's holding a flag. And do you see what's on his flag? Looks like a stag with the resurrection on top of it, yeah. Exactly, a stag with the resurrection on top. So the legend, a medieval legend the crucifixion, of Saint, I'm sorry, yeah, crucifixion. crucifixion. The, the legend of Saint Eustache was a medieval le legend that he went hunting with a court and he was hunting a deer. And when he saw the deer, he suddenly saw a vision of Christ on a crucifix appear between the land enter, uh, antlers. And he heard momentous, at the same moment he heard the voice of God telling him to convert. And that same day he went and was converted to Christianity. And the story is very long, but this became a very popular story, particularly in Germany. This idea of seeing the nature within the antlers of the deer, revelation. Again, he was out to murder this deer, right? And he saves him because he sees the vision of Christ. Now, when we go back to the beetle from 1505, that little drawing, this is a particular beetle. It's not any kind of, I mean, you probably haven't seen beetle like this lately. This is called the stag beetle, named after the stag that has exact antlers as Saint Eustache would have seen. So we are the viewer in the microcosm world of nature of Albrecht Dürer. We are to rest out, to wrestle. Remember how you said rest out of nature, the vision of Christ, O oh God, even in the smallest glimpse of nature. This is what I believe that he's trying to present to us. And this is kind of new. Uh, again, I just wanted to share with our viewers today. Any comments, any suggestions why he would have painted beetles? Should we keep going or stop for a moment? I think we can keep going. I, I, the comment that I have about this beetle is it's very much like the hair, right? It's a living thing. It's alive. He paints its shadow. There's movement. Its head is lifted. It's not like those other images that you showed that are so um, still as if they were pinned to a board, right? This beetle is, he's like he's capturing it on the move. Exactly, crawling on that piece of paper. And a very famous artist, John Baldessari, uh, who recently passed away, created a monumental homage to this beetle at the Getty Museum. I didn't include it in this presentation, but he, he actually printed it on a huge canvas, two-story high, it hangs at the Getty Museum. And he took a big pin 
a metal pin and pinned the painting crooked onto the wall, almost like <laughs> capturing the life of this beetle. But he was referring to this idea of illusion, of crawling on the paper, of life, and, and questioning whether it's life or death or how he's making it. So it's a fun piece, too. You can always visit uh, the Getty, and it's always on view. You could see it right in front of their auditorium. Somebody okay. wanted to know if this beetle was common uh, for common enough for him to find it locally, or do you think he saw him, you know, saw a drawing of it or saw it on his travels? Maybe it's very interesting that Dura was com collecting uh, of far away and bizarre things. He spent a lot of money. We know that his wife was very upset that he was really spending money on little stones, shells, uh, stuffed animals, uh, books that showed from faraway travels what faraway animals would look like. His famous rhinoceros that I did not include was done out of imagination. So Dura's rhinoceros wears the armor just like the soldier because that's what he imagined it would look like. So I think it would probably be either something that he has in his collection or, or knows about. Um, pretty amazing. But here I think he, he must be looking at the actual beetle from observation. So probably from, these, from the, this uh, amazing uh, idea of his collecting, collecting obsession with, mm -hmm. with bizarre and amazing interpretation of nature by, by a divine. Now, we mentioned his father. I also wanted to mention his mother. And this is an incredible drawing, charcoal on paper. Uh, just the, the, the presence of these eyes. These are Durer's eyes. If we actually compared his self-portrait, they're very similar. But this is his mother um, towards the end of her life. And so they're almost bugging out of her face, right? She has seen so much. Uh, her husband, Albrecht, had died. And Durer took his mother in with him. She lived with him for, I think, almost 10 years. He adored her, wrote a lot about her. And something that I find really kind of almost ironic after giving birth to 18 children and being done with that part of her life, Dura employs her and she takes his prints and goes out to art markets, to the squares, and sells in these little booths, like an art booth, uh, the work by Albrecht Dura. So he actually commissioned her to be her, his saleswoman. Kind of an interesting touch. Uh, but he really was uh, close to her, really loved her, and uh, he had watched her die in his own home. And he wrote in his diary, I saw how death gave her two great stabs in the heart and how she closed her mouth and eyes and passed away in the midst of her pain. So this event really moved him. And this drawing is made in 1514 in the year of her death. And it is in the year where he creates his most famous etch, uh, engraving uh, called Melancholia. So this uh, is the Mona Lisa of engravings, perhaps the most important engraving of, of all times. On a large scale, uh, uh, 9 by 7 inches is actually a very large metal plate to be wrestling with. And it was done as part of three master prints. Uh, the one other one we will look at the end of the presentation. Uh, there was a St. Jerome and Death and the Devil and Melancholia, three masterpieces on this grand scale. Now, it has been called Melancholia One because it bears that writing on the banner that's being held by this curious animal at the top, flying above. And we have the title. Remember this idea of a text and image. Here, once again, uh, was taken by art historians as the title for this work. However, Dura did not specifically title it this way. It has only been interpreted that way. And for many, many centuries, it was looked upon as this frustrated genius who has all these tools of, tools of knowledge. We find geometry tools and measuring tools and building tools all thrown out throughout the uh, background, on the floor, rejected by this uh, 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 character that's sitting down, also sitting down, kind of given up, dark and brooding and moody, um, and that even the dog looks emaciated and sad. However, this is only the first entrance of Dürer's work. In my opinion, he's showing you the transformation of that state of inertia and melancholy to the higher level of divine connection. And if we look at the word that's in the banner, melancholia, 
it can actually, we already talked about how Dura loves to play with language. It could be shuffled around to be seen as an anagram becoming from all these letters a very different word. The word is chameleon. And chameleon, for the humanists, was the animal, a symbol of transformation and potential, the human potential of rising themselves from the lower level, crawling with the bugs on the ground, to the angelic transformation towards God. And if you want to know more about this, I have a big article out in the Brill Journal, or we can come back and do a whole special, uh, another lecture about the transformation in Melancholia 1. But it is not what it seems. It is to transform and rise out of melancholy to the next level. And to show you this a little bit more, I introduce you to the famous magic square that Dürer included in his work of art. If we go back, you could see it on the upper right corner above that angelic being. Now we close in and look at the magic square. This magic square is known, the reason it's called magic, for a couple of reasons. One is was seen as a talisman. It is known as particularly Jupiter square, for it adds up to a certain number, no matter which way you go. If you go horizontally through any of these rows, 16, 3, 2, 13, or vertically, 13, 8, 12, 1, or diagonally, right, 16, 10, 7, 1, or within quadrants, 2, 13, 8, 11, you always get number 34. So it is designed in such a way that you come back to this magical number, and much has been written about what does 34 mean, but what I'd like to attract you to two ideas. One, that this magic square is not Dura square. It has been mistakenly called Dura square. This was a practice that we find in the great uh, philosophical writings of three books of occult knowledge by Agrippa, a great contemporary um, uh, of Dura. And he here in his notes, this is actually from his book, he says this is uh, Jupiter square, and it comes from the Hebraic knowledge. What he means is what we know as Jewish mysticism called Kabbalah. And we see the same square. On the right, we see Jewish Hebrew letters. Hebrew letters have numeric values. So you can actually take the, the Hebrew letter, and you'll know that um, on the right, on the far right, we have Aleph, which is the first letter, like letter A. That would be one in our magic square. These type of uh, Kabbalistic squares were used for meditation upon divine names. Because you can transfer the numbers into letters, you can then spell divine names of God or angelic names, and it will protect you. It becomes like a talisman. So here we have actually uh, Dürer using the talismanic square to also help him transition from melancholic mood to that of Jupiter square. Jupiter was considered the planet that is healing to melancholia, that is conducive for creation and for uplifted mood. But even more interesting, something that Dura sees in the square and the reason that he uses it. So down below, we find at the bottom of this angelic uh, 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 being, we find the year in which he created it, which is what? 1514. And his initials, which are what? AD. Which is A is 1, and D is 4. Now, if we look at the bottom of the square, we have 1, 4, which is AD, and we have 1514, the year in which Dura created this uh, amazing engraving. Now, he did not come up with a square, but you could see that he used an upside down version. If you look at the square that Agrippa is looking at, the 1415 is at the top and would have been a reverse, kind of a reverse, same numbers, but just done in reverse. And in order to emphasize and insert himself into the square, Dura actually uses this particular configuration, right? So again, we see him inserted within this talismanic image. Hope you find it as fascinating as I always do. And one more way that he inserts himself. Now, this is really fascinating. So you see that there are two main characters. There is an adult-looking angel, and there is a smaller angel. 
that's see, sitting there. And can you tell from far away just by looking at it, Jeff, what he's doing? It's hard to tell, right? It is hard to tell, but I know, so it's not fair to ask me. But. Okay, so as we close <laughs> in, <laughs> we see a little bit closer that he is busy on He's busy actually drawing, yeah. Drawing or even probably most likely engraving. It looks like he is using the tool uh, like a burin that you use to create the lines in the metal that Jura would have been using, the very similar tool on the engraving board. You put your metal board, almost like a cooking board inside so it doesn't shift. And he's using this little board. Do you see the, looks like a cutting board with a little uh, ring around it. Let's see if I come a little bit closer. Something that you can hang on the wall, right? And mm -hmm. he's busy engraving. Now, this particular board is very dear to Dewar. He uses it uh, in his craft. And in his very famous and beautiful uh, engraving of Adam and Eve, you actually see it. I want to go back and forth for a moment. You see where Adam is standing and holding the tree branch, and there's a parrot above his shoulder? That same engraving board is hanging. And if we look at it, Albrecht Dürer uses it for signing his name. <clears throat> so here he inserts himself once again in the work of art. So where we see the little putti, the little angel, in, in the act of engraving, it is again in Melancholia 1, is a way for Dürer to be self-referential. You can enter that work of art in so many ways, and again, it would take us hours to diverge it, to, the, to really to take it apart. But I wanted to switch to a very interesting idea the idea of human proportion, something preoccupied Dura for all of his life. He had many treatises, treatises uh, written, but after the end of his life, posthumously, his wife and his best friend published this four-part volume, which is really incredible, that goes over the secret knowledge of proportion. Dura was convinced that the Italians knew the secret. He traveled to Italy twice. Some people say one of the reasons he traveled to Italy was to avoid the plague that was spreading out in Germany at the time, again, making it more relevant to us. But it was also to find out from the old masters from uh, even the old masters for him at the time, uh, their secret knowledge that he believed that they passed on throughout generations. Now, this is an incredible book, and uh, art academies still study from it today, how to show the face in perspective, how to turn, how to show motion. Really incredible. But uh, he really wanted to separate himself from the other German artists who did not know this craft, who did not know this mathematics and geometry of perspective. And in some of his uh, works of art, this is the birth of the Virgin uh, uh, in woodcut that you can find in many museums, including the Metropolitan Museum. If you look, can you actually find, Jeff, the signature by Dürer? At the very bottom there, also yes, on at the, the very board, bottom, right? almost in the middle, yeah. Notice something that uh, you notice how he reversed it uh, in the witch. Here he shows it to you in perspective, receding into a vanishing point. So he's really trying to show off even his signature now in perspective. He designed one of his most famous paintings now in Prado in Madrid, life-size, gorgeous representation of Adam and Eve based on his understanding of perspective. So these are um, ideal and proportion. These are ideal bodies. These man and woman would not exist. These are not taken from model. This is mathematically calculated. And we can find many illustrations how to do this in his book. But what I wanted to attract your attention again for a moment is how Albrecht inserts himself within this painting. And I bet you already started noticing his signature. It hangs literally from the branch, from the fig leaf that is used for Eve. And literally from the offspring of that fig leaf, we find that uh, engraving board and a little piece of paper attached with a signature of Dura with a message. Wouldn't you want to know what that message says? In Latin, Albrecht Dura. Uh, for German, that refers for the geographic position of Nuremberg, made this 1507 years after the virgin's offspring. So he's trying to actually calculate, again, AD, 
Yes, we come from Eve, but I'm coming from the time of Christ, counting from Mary, from Immaculate Conception. So there is a weaving in of tradition, the, the story of the sin, and he says, yeah, I am sinful man. I'm human being. I hang from that tree, and yet I'm kind of redeemed as well through Christ 15 or, or 7 years later after virgins giving birth to Christ. So very interesting, another insertion of Christianity and stories and Bible in his own interpretation within his own image. We don't have a self-portrait, but we have a self-reference, right? And what's so interesting that I wanted to mention about proportions, and we'll skip a few of my slides because I think we've gone over an hour already, but, um, and perhaps we'll return to him again, right? Absolutely. But what I, what I wanted to show you, that nothing could look more different from Eve than this image. This is a, a detail from his painting Avarice. I stood in front of it in the Vienna Museum, uh, Historici Museum uh, in Vienna. I hope we all go there to, together someday. Today we're traveling virtually. This is a detail of the woman in her old age reminding us that time, temporality of time and really uh, taking advantage of what we can do now before we become frail. But it is not only that. Through his ideal proportions, remember Eve, how beautiful she was, and all of that writing, he comes to a conclusion, which is really shocking. Shocking for a man of his time, a Christian, or a anybody, right? He kind of rises himself out of this ideal, and this is what he writes. I want to share with you a long quote. I'm just going to move my little screen, which you don't see, but blocks the writing. Okay. I therefore hold that the more exactly a picture is made to resemble men, the better that work will be. But many are of another opinion. I would tell us how men should be. I would not quarrel with them for that. But in this matter, I hold that nature is a teacher and that the fancies of men are foolishness. The Creator made men as they should be, and I hold that the comely form of fairness are found in the multitude of all men. He who can draw that out rightly, him will I rather follow than one who would make a measurement of his own finding, which some men have had. What he's trying to say that everyone is beautiful. We can find beauty everywhere. It is not in ideal proportions. We should look at the old and the suffering and the sick, and there is beauty in everyone. Incredible statement. And I would sign on it right now, and I think it's still revolutionary. What do you think, Jeff? Absolutely, especially taken into the context of all of his searching for a divine proportion uh, to, uh, at the end of his life, uh, summarize it all by really the beauty exists within everyone. And uh, it is. It, it's it's. It's a very astonishing statement to, to make after all those years trying to perfect a proportion, right? Find this common denominator of what makes us beautiful and then say, no, 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 I was wrong in a way. I was wrong, I, yeah. I was yeah. wrong. It's everywhere. And that is going back to that quote, resting with nature. What are you going to wrestle out? And that, I think, is the big profound statement that he discovers, this philosophical idea everyone, beauty is everywhere, and it's in everyone. And I wonder if there's any comments or uh, reactions from our viewers on that. So as you please, please, please uh, share with us your ideas, how you feel about that. Can that old woman without teeth and gray hair and wrinkles be considered beautiful in the eyes, in our eyes? Can we see beauty there? Um, and I'd love to hear from you. Now, well, Maria I just, is saying he, in the end he became a true humanist. I very like true, that. very like true. That. I'm going actually to probably, Jeff, uh, uh, skip uh, over a couple of images, I because I think we've been going on for a long time, unless you insist uh, as you see them. Uh, just very quickly, this is actually uh, uh, Durer's wife. We should mention his wife. Uh, I would say Durer's Eve, right? Since we're talking about Eve, uh, she, the marriage was very uneventful. It was really a business arrangement for both of them, and they had very little in common. And moreover, 
it was a childless marriage. So there was nothing significant, nothing, no warmth in it, except for she posed a few times for him, and we have this incredible drawing surviving. And also she was engaged by Dura to sell his work, so she was a little bit of his business manager. And it's interesting that this drawing is made for a study of a painting where his wife is used to be Saint Anne, the mother of Mary, grandmother of Christ, uh, the child, the most important child for Durer, but in a way it's so ironic that he himself did not have children, right? Interesting how he casts her in this role. Now I'm going to skip over this uh, altarpiece that I was going to talk about, but I, I'm afraid I would need another hour uh, yeah, to get this, through it. I love this painting and the four apostles. Uh, maybe you can share just that what you love about it so that we can that we can close in on the four apostles. I used to do studies of this painting when I was an undergraduate, the composition of it. So it was always the composition that I struck and also the oppositions. It's almost like a yin and yang uh, uh, painting in terms of values and and the way each people are looking. One is looking out, one is looking in, one looking up, one is looking down. <laughs> Uh, you know, the feet are facing out, the feet are facing in. It's, it's almost like he, wherever he did one thing in one panel, he did the opposite in the other panel. And, and that was something that I really enjoyed uh, about it. And yeah, now I can't resist. I must say a couple of things about it. Just can't, <laughs> resi just can't resist. I hope you guys put up with us for a few more minutes. But uh, this is so incredible because remember, Though Martin Luther is so important for Reformation, he's kind of terrible for the artist because it's ironic. On one hand, he's crit criticizing the church, right, uh, which in its own day was important because the church was abusing its privileges and uh, uh, there was pr big problems going on, which later Reformation itself faced the same issues once it lost its glorious beginnings. So human, human, human beings are always human, right? There's always going to be embezz embe uh, embezzling and stealing and, and all of that because we're human. Remember, we came, you know, in Dura's eye, we came from as much from Eve as we did from Mary. But what's so bad about Luther and the church for the artists, because the church was our main patron. The churches who paid for all these altarpieces to the artists gave lots of money, and you came with that came visibility. There were no museums. There were no invisible museum tour. The church was the museum. That's where you exhibited your work, right? And so in Germany, in Nuremberg, the church is not going to commission Dürer these paintings, and Dürer takes the plunge, and he makes his own work without anyone paying for it. He painted this. This is really, again, unbelievable at this time, for himself. And it's because he wants to paint this image. He's going to take the materials extremely expensive. His time is expensive. He's going to basically invest in himself. And then he's going to do even something more amazing. He gifts this painting to the city of Nuremberg Council. He gifts it. And he writes a letter, he says, this is one of my best undertakings. I was always going to do this, but I was waiting when I would make my most beautiful masterpiece, and now I gift it to the city. And the, he gifts it to the city so that he would hang where? No longer in the church, but where are people going? To the city hall. This is where people are really congregating, there's meetings, there's signing of the documents. So he's putting himself in the modern museum, the new museum public space. The city hall, a uh, really amazing kind of twist on his part. Now, of course, the city gave him a gift uh, of money, a return for this gift, a gift for gift. So he ends up making money, and this painting hangs in the city uh, 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 tower. Now, what's so amazing about this, go back to the idea where we started, the text and image. And I don't know if you noticed that these four um, apostles, they have uh, a text below their feet. We go a little bit closer. It is so elaborate. This is not easy to do in oil paint to write in this minute writing. And these are basically quotes from each one of the apostles from their writings, right? So you can uh, match the text and image by the thoughts and by their philosophy. But it starts not by them, but it starts by the thought of Durer. And he sends a message. He says, all worldly rulers in these dangerous times 
should give good heed that they receive not human misguidance for the word of God, for God will have nothing added to his word, nor taken away from it. This is from Dura. This is not from the four evangelists, right? He's kind of putting himself in this prophetic position. And what he's saying, that he will not put up with false prophets. False prophets as they could be in religion or in politics or in, uh, in, in the social environment. No lying, only the truth. Stick to the truth. Amazing message from 500 years ago. What do you think, Fantastic. Jeff? All right. So, any, by the way, any comments from our audience? Any questions? as we wrap up. Uh, nothing new so far. We still have, well, Michael Fuller was asking about the discoverer of the golden ratio, and that actually existed before Durer, and I'm sure he knew of its principles. Um, yes. But, uh, yeah, that goes all the way back to the, the Greeks and Euclid, I think, but I'm not, a, I'm not, I can't, don't quote me on that one. Uh, all right, so um, definitely you want to look at uh, Durer's book of geometry for that. Um, he, he really goes into the mathematics and ge geometry and construction and formulas, and it is the most advanced math. It's the first actually treatise in German on mathematics. Uh, uh, from which uh, it was studied, mathematics was studied. It's really incredible and gives you a whole other dimension of Dürer's mind. But here he is, a very intimate pen and ink uh, drawing that was thought that he actually drew for his doctor. Or you see the text above, right? The writing above. And it's a very informal little drawing and there's a little circle uh, to which Durer is pointing. He is nude, right? Just wear, wears little Kel Kelvin Klein underwear there. And then he's pointing <laughs> onto his ribs, right? And there's a little circle there. And the text says, this is the yellow spot, and when I press my finger in it, it hurts. So for many years it was thought about that perhaps this was written to his doctor, and he did contract a uh, um, a strange disease in his travels. This is a bit earlier than uh, that episode, but he did have pains throughout his life, and it exasperated after his travels to the ne Netherlands, and um, actually was thought that he might have had malaria. It was never diagnosed. Uh, but what's interesting here, whether or not this is true, that this was written for his doctor, there's something else on his mind. And this is a drawing of the man of sorrows, of passion, of Christ, by Albrecht Dürer from 1511, almost the same year. And here Christ is showing his wound from the Holy Lance. This is a vision of Christ after he had died, after he has appears uh, from the crucifixion to doubting Thomas, and he shows the wound from the lance with which he was finally killed. And it's so interesting if we compare the position on the body, right? It's almost the same spot. So here again, He's thinking about identification, but it's this interesting identification of Christ throughout his career. So it's something I wanted to point out. And already when he's sick in his 15, 1520s, uh, we have an amazing document. That's perhaps we're going to wrap up with this document today, uh, which is so unlikely. Another thing about Durer, he notated his dreams. He wakes up. And he not only writes his dream, but he also paints it in watercolor. And here, Jeff, do you know this one? I've seen the image, but I don't know the script, no. Hey, I'd love to share it with you and for our audience. So he says, and I'm going to read the whole thing because it's kind of an amazing description, very poetic. In 1525, during the night between Wednesday and Thursday, after with sun tide, I had this vision in my sleep and saw how many great waters fell from heaven. The first struck the ground about four miles away from me with such a terrible force, enormous noise and splashing that it drowned the entire countryside. I was so greatly shocked at this that I awoke before the cloud burst. 
and the ensuing downpour was huge. Some of the waters fell some distance away and some close by, and they came from such a height that they seemed to fall at an equally slow pace. But the very first water that hit the ground so suddenly had fallen at such velocity and was accompanied by wind and roaring so frightening that when I awoke, my whole body trembled and I could not recover for a long time. When I arose in the morning, I painted the above as I had seen it. May the Lord turn all things to the best. And this is what's so amazing. So he writes this down and he paints this. Now, this is probably the beginning of contemporary art. This is the most abstract painting that we have from 1500s. This downpouring of water, which is literally watercolor that Jeff talked about, letting the paint drip in the middle of nowhere. To me, this is one of the most stunning images. He has this anticipation of the end, and the end was near his own life. Towards the end of his life, uh, he must have had, he had a lot of pain, and he, even by his friends, said that he became less social. Um, I included this image, but we don't really have too much time to talk about it. This is a famous print that went with Melancholia I. This is one of the three master's prints. So this is done much earlier in 1513, Night, Death, and the Devil. And the knight heroically travels in the face of death. We have death counting on the sand clock, right? The hour clock, hourglass. How many seconds left for this man to survive? But the knight does not look at death. He is going forward with his mission. And down below, once again, you recognize your signature on his engraving block. And look, 1513, this is quite early, but he is aware of his own mortality. The skull of death looks straight at AD initials. And this, the very same uh, wood block that we talked about, that, that engraving board, is the shape of what goes on Durer's grave. You see it, you recognize it now. And it has the most profound, amazing epitaph written for any man who lived. The inscription was made by Durer's best friend that we mentioned earlier on, Perkheimer, and what it says. What was mortal of Albrecht Dürer lies beneath this mount. Which seems so simple, but what he's trying to say, Dürer was immortal. He lives through his art. The journey that we have taken today is to literally meet Albrecht Dürer. He's real, he's with us, and he's helping us on our own tough journeys. And with that, we come to the very conclusion and questions and comments. All right, we got some just incredible, fascinating, lots of interest in the subject matter. Some folks, I think, had heard of Durer, but hadn't really known anything more about him than the famous watercolor, right? One thing well, we need to talk about that I well also found fascinating on more of, I guess, a practical level was just the his immersion in his promotion of the self uh, you know was very uh, much a part of who he was too there there was this identity that we talked about in humanism the elevation of the artist to a new status uh, and uh, he went after that uh, tirelessly uh, to create an image around an aura around himself and everything that he did that's so fun uh, that you remind me of something I wanted to say. Uh, he was a first on so many things in that way, that self-identity. He was actually the first on winning a copyright lawsuit. Yeah. So uh, because he became so famous so fast and there was monetary value in his anagram, right, in his AD mm -hmm. anagrams, a signature, um, that uh, artists copied his prints, which was not so difficult to copy and reprint, but they actually inserted signed by AD. They actually copied his signature. And so he did the first uh, uh, copyright lawsuit, and he won. So the, law, the judge said, you can copy Durer, but you cannot copy his name copy and his, his anagram. Signature. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that and was that very interesting. interesting.
And I also show very quickly in case uh, there are millions of books on Durer and they keep coming. Uh, my own new article uh, is also soon to be published. Uh, but I just put a few that are all times favorites. And we have uh, 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 older books that you can find online, including a reprint of 1870, a uh, wonderful translation of his letters and diaries. So you can buy it relatively inexpensive as a reprint. Uh, you see the history of life of Albrecht Dürer with translation of his letters. So I just wanted to put out a few resources. Yeah, we really just teased you. This is the tip of the iceberg for, for Dürer. He, he has a fascinating life and you can go down so many rabbit holes and and it's just wonderful. And some of these pieces too, we could go on and on and on. So um, I think melancholy I is probably the most studied image uh, in terms of disguised symbolism of all other graphic works <laughs> from Western that is, art. Right? That is true. There's the most written about that at engraving than any other work of art, more than written yeah. than, than Mona Lisa. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, any other questions, last minute thoughts? We'd love to hear from you. We will come back to Dura at some point. We have amazing thing uh, planned for you for the next few months. Uh, the next the month, it will be actually thematic since we have appear around Christmas. We are going to look at the most amazing images of uh, nativity scenes and um, annunciations. And we have more and more planned each month for you thematically and diving into biographies. Please stay with us. Thank you so much, Zenia. This has been fascinating. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, the Invisible Museum Tour, sponsored by Royal Talents. Don't forget to like and follow us on Facebook. Be eligible win that Rembrandt watercolor set so you can make your own Albrecht Durs. Uh, but, uh, but please, like Zenia said, join us next time. Follow us here, uh, and we'll see everybody soon. Thank you so much, everyone. AD. AD.